My name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. Well, as you can see, I've got the Eve mod installed once again, environmental visual enhancements, but I went a little bit past that. Uh, again, taking advantage of performance increases that have come with 1.1. Thought I'd push what I can do a little bit further. I've also installed the Scatterer mod, and I have got to say, this is flipping gorgeous. And I'll talk about this launch and what's coming up in this episode in just a little bit, but I thought I'd start off by just pulling the camera back and kind of admiring what these mods are adding to the game. A uh, Scatterer mod adds in realistic lighting atmospheric effects, or more realistic anyway. I love the sort of haze that's in around the mountains there. We are launching, by the way, just after sunset. Right now, let's move this out of the way and take a look down here at the bottom. You can see the City Light Mods is installed, but instead of it being sort of... I always felt the area around Kerbin with the old City Lights used to look like one giant subdivision. But now I love it. It's all these little towns and stuff. It looks great. Much more realistic. Oh, the sun's coming. Yeah! Oh, J.J. Abrams would be proud. Look at that lens flare. <laughs> yeah. A lens flare in, in, in a digital format I always find interesting. Uh, you know, it, it, way, you know, back in the day, <laughs> in the old decades ago in movies, cinematographers worked hard to eliminate lens flare. They didn't want lens flare. Lens flare was considered an aberration. And it was sort of in the 70s where film started getting a little bit more grittier, a little bit more realistic. Uh, they went to this documentary or pseudo-documentary format in a lot of films. And so they started leaving the lens flare in. But what's really funny is when you know CGI started coming in, of course what you're watching right now is completely CGI, uh, people got so used to seeing lens flare that it felt more realistic with the lens flare in so of course it's added in digitally there are no lenses at all of course but it's kind of funny because of course your eyes don't have lens flare so if you're actually somehow here watching this this is not what you would see this is kind of like what some magical camera would see all right gorgeous okay let's talk a bit about this launch this is the dream chaser we have six Kerbals aboard here, uh, and what they are is they are the crew for our next Korion 3 mission, or our next Korion 3 mission, our first Korion 3 mission. Korion 3, of course, is docked at Kerbin Station, and we're going to send out the crew. You can see that we have, for our pilot, Valentina, we have Wilman along as our engineer, and then we have our newest Kerbinaut that we introduced last episode, McNand. Uh, McNandar's new scientist who's never been in space before so actually I'm not going to take him on this mission I'm actually going to uh, leave him on Kerbin Station let him get some low orbit experience first and we're going to take Luya who's on Kerbin Station and stick her in his place and then also along for the ride we have a total of three tourists uh, so this is a full boat <laughs> this is the maximum number of people that we can fit on here. And if you take a look at my tourist there on the far right, you will see his textures are, well, quite messed up indeed. Um, uh, I was It was pointed out in the comments, people noticed that uh, McNand actually has a female character or texture put on him. That's why he looks a little strange. Though I'm going to keep him that way because I don't know. I like him. But uh, the tourist that's right beside McNand actually has lips sort of between his eyes. <laughs> Looks like war paint. But those are actually lips from a female texture. Since they're uh, tourists, I don't care. We won't be seeing them too much in the future. But uh, I think from now on I'll make sure that my, my uh, herbals are all getting appropriate texture. See, there are my other tourists. And you can see there's another male there with a female texture put on him he looks a little strange and then one female tourist who actually does have a female texture which is correct of course i don't know maybe texture replacers just starting with the females and can't find the males i don't know anyway before we get these folks to the station and get their mission on the road we can spend still a little bit more time admiring eve and city lights and real plume and scatterer you know one of the real things i 
really like about Scatter too is it puts this kind of blue overlay on top of the cloud textures and terrain textures uh, around planets like Kerbin. And I, I love it. It's entirely much more real. I mean, the atmosphere is blue. It's not super clear. You can't just see perfectly clearly right down to the surface. So this blue overlay really adds a beautiful touch. If you take a look at the coastline there towards the right on Kerbin, you can see the sun's reflection off the water. It's just sort of coming below us right now. That sort of glowy area, that's the sun reflecting off the surface of the water. That is just wonderful too. Anyway, enough geeking out over these beautification mods. Uh, something else I got coming up in this episode is the launch of MapSat 6. MapSat 6 is going into a polar orbit about Kerbin, which, yeah, is pretty dull, but I thought I would use the opportunity, because I don't think I've talked about this in the past, about how to calculate the delta V requirements for launching into different inclinations like polar orbits and... Uh, you know, retrograde orbits and any other inclination in between. How much more delta V is it going to cost you to do this? Well, it's at least the way I calculate it, but it seems to work. Maybe you folks can take a look at it and tell me what I'm doing wrong, but you know, it works for me. But that's for the end of the episode. If you are not afraid of a little bit of math, you know, just stick around for that. Okay, so we are docked. So we'll make sure to make, to supply the Karaya with everything that it needs and transfer over the crew. And now that i got crew in the Karaya, I think it would be good to take a look at the interiors of these uh, mole parts. So this is uh, the pilot's view through Valentina's eye. She's in the Brumby capsule. I really like these large forward-facing windows. They look really good. I'm trying to uh, click on the window to sort of look out them better, but... Uh, doesn't seem to want to do that. It's a little strange, but you can see a really nice interior, a uh, couple of raster prop monitor screens, lots of buttons and stuff, lots of supplies and canisters and very, very detailed interior. Really, really nice. Okay, let's, uh, let's flip over to Wilman. Much the same view, of course. Looking up at the length of the station. This is inside the lab module, a little laptop with a KOS thing on there. <laughs> Nothing that the screen doesn't do anything. Again, lots of detail in the interior. Can't click on the window. Don't know why. A little cactus. And here are the tourists in the hitchhiker. Looking ready to go. And, ooh, okay, uh, maybe that should be our cue to leave. Okay, so we're undocked now. Put on the RCS. We'll back away a little bit. That'd be fun to watch this from inside here. You can see Kerbin out of the starboard window. It's looking beautiful below us. Now let's see if we can uh, pitch forward a little bit. See if we can. Uh, Get a little bit of view of the station as we leave. There we go. So the plan, I haven't talked about what the mission is. We are exiting the Kerbin system, just sort of sticking a toe out, getting out there in orbit around the sun, and then coming back. And this is actually the second time I've done a mission like this. I did the mission like this quite some time ago with the Korion one. And we're actually going to do the same thing I did before as well. We're going to uh, blow by Minmus on our way out of here. And uh, this is really all, most, well, about two things really. Uh, science is one of them. I do have a gravity scanner aboard this thing, so we'll be doing gravity scans around Minmus. That's why I wanna go by Minmus to uh, pick up that science. Um, and number two, I do have a couple of contracts associated with this. The three tourists, I guess you had to know there were tourist contracts associated with them. They all want to orbit the sun, goody for them. And I also have uh, a mission to put a station in orbit about the sun. And this thing does qualify as a space station, even though it won't be staying in orbit around the sun. These Kerbal interstellar nuclear engines do take a bit get up to full thrust so you can see we're not exactly there we're, now we're perceivably moving away from the station uh, but they do get up this thing has a total of just over 100 kilonewtons of thrust once it's all 
warmed up and that's a thrust to weight ratio of almost 0.4 when fully fueled so it's fully capable of getting us where we need to go the one thing i'm doing uh that i did a little bit wrong the first time i did a mission of this kind is i made sure to give myself enough velocity here in low carbon orbit to exit uh, the Kerbin system in a timely manner. Uh, when I did this before, I didn't give myself enough velocity. I just gave myself enough velocity to get to Minmus. And then at Minmus, I had to do another burn. That's an inefficient way to go. It also made the whole mission take a whole lot longer. So uh, this time, I'm making sure that I'm giving most of my oomph uh, here in low Kerbin orbit, taking advantage of the O Earth effect. This still does require a correction burn. Uh, so a few hours later, we were out doing a correction burn because of Minmus' inclined orbit, and Kerbin Station, of course, is in an equatorial orbit. With this burn, I'm also trying to affect... Ooh, I love when the, tra the trajectories all blow around. There we go. Um, I'm also trying to affect where my exit from Kerbin's sphere of influence is going to be. You can see it there at the end of that purple trajectory. That's where I'm exiting Kerbin's sphere of influence and I'd really like to be as close to the equatorial plane as I can, which makes getting back to Kerbin Station easier. A little more, I think. Yeah. Ooh, that's looking pretty close to the equatorial plane of Kerbin. Okay, let's get a better look here. And oh, oh, I've lost my, let's get back. Yeah, I've lost my periapsis with Minmus, which means I'm hitting Minmus. Well, we certainly don't want to be doing that, so that required a couple more playing around with some radial and some normal to get things the way I wanted them to be, using Min Miss's gravity to affect my trajectory and getting me exiting Kerbin's sphere of influence where I want it to be. But anyway, we ended up with this trajectory that will have us passing Min Miss in about four days. We'll be coming within 17 kilometers of Min Miss's minty surface, and that's actually going to be a little bit later in this episode. And then 12 days from now, we will be exiting Kerbin's sphere of influence without having to make any other burns. Uh, that will obviously be for a future episode. But right now, why don't we make a brief stop with Karayan 1, which is docked with asteroid Yoi in a polar orbit about the moon, which is just finishing off the last of its gravity scans to pick up as much science as we can around the moon. I am always in that science scrounge mode, needing more and more science. And then I had, in an episode of, full of geeky moments, geeking about Scatterer, I think I had my geekiest moment. All right. Twin Craters, there it is. Okay, stop. Collect that gravity science, okay, get Bob out there. He will EVA and collect it. And that is the last of the low altitude gravity science. We'll be, we transmitted what we could, we'll be taking what's left back. We'll close our scan sat windows, we'll get ready to get out of here. Brian is, whoa! Look at Kerbin. Oh my gosh, look at the, there's the, the black, is, uh, is that what I think it is? Where's the sun? There's the sun. Is everything lined up right for this? I mean, it certainly looks like what I think it is. Kerbin is nice and full. Oh, that is so cool. Let's go back. I think everything is lined up right. In case you haven't figured it out yet, what I think we are looking at here is a solar eclipse, but what it would look like from our perspective. Well, there's one way to t tell for sure. Let's time warp and see if that little spot moves. Oh my God. Oh my God, this is so amazing. Yeah, it did move. If you look at Kerbin, that spot moved. That is gorgeous. I wasn't expecting that at all. That might be one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Well, Time Warp again, you can see that the dark umbra and then the fuzzy penumbra around it. That is absolutely friggin' amazing. Well, thank you, Scatterer. I knew some of the things you did, but I wasn't expecting that. That 
really made my day. Anyway, back with the Karayan 3, now coming into its closest approach on Minmus, frantically as well, gathering gravity science once again, using the MapSat mod to help me out and see what biomes are coming out. And oh, whoa, what just happened to my big map? Okay, let's get the big map back. We'll bring back up the ScanSat main window here in Big Map. Wait, Big Map. I'm clicking on the Big Map button and I'm not getting my Big Map. Okay, what is going on here? I really want my Big Map. Okay, let's close everything. Okay, close this. Open it again. Big Map. Nope. It is not there. And try as I might, and after this I tried for quite some time to try to figure out what happened to my big map, and I could not get it back. But the thing is, is, well, we are coming into space near Minmus very, very quickly here. So I had to sort of give this up for now. If any of you have any idea as to why I lost my big map, please share it in the comments, because I haven't figured out what happened yet but right now i can't really worry about it i am getting to near space very soon oh there goes the camera okay transmit get that off and then we'll collect again and Luya will have to go out and clear the scanner and this actually we're not in near space very long now one thing that is really nice is that i don't have to perform a burn here uh so uh we can just go out and worry only about the science but uh, Luya had a lot of uh <laughs> zigging and zagging and collecting and storing and transmitting of science, trying to grab what we can. Kerbal Engineer does help. It does give us biomes. And we do have the zoomed in map, just not the big map. But uh, we are moving fast. So we have to, oh, transmit that. There we go. Send that off. And then once that's finished transmitting, we will be collecting again and storing it. And uh, yeah, it was all over pretty quickly. Yeah, we are going to get the science that we were going to get on our brief flyby of Minmus. And pretty soon the crew of the Karayan were saying goodbye to Minmus on their way out of the Kerbin Sphere of Influence. And we will be revisiting with them when they do exit the Kerbin Sphere of Influence in a future episode. But right now, why don't we get to the Kerbal Space Center and see if we have enough science to unlock another node. And in that time, between that play session and this play session, I upgraded a couple of mods, including Contract Configurator, which has changed the interface here a little bit in Mission Control. Actually, it's done a little bit more than change this interface. It's given me a buttload of new contract. I used to find I could only carry about a maximum of about 15 or so with the reputation that I had. But now, that has been upped. A fair bit and I have a lot of contracts here available to me and what I like is how they have split it between types as you can see here I can carry up to 14 of the one star contracts 11 of the two star contracts and up to eight of the three star contracts that's a total of 33 did I do that math right yeah I did <laughs> 33 contracts that's more than twice what I could carry before so well it is time to start scooping up some contracts and then once I was done with that it was time to spend my science on another tier 8 node and uh this was a tough decision I mean here we got the nuclear jet engines these are from Kerbal Interstellar Extended. Um, you might recall I actually played with them before. I built a jet that I actually was able to get suborbital on these things alone. So they are quite cool. And then an update to Kerbal Interstellar Extended pushed these later into the tech tree, probably rightfully so. Uh, I also took a serious look at uh, the better stock jet engines i could have got the whiplash ramjet engine along with the high velocity air intakes i mean that's uh potential space plane type material right there but what i ended up with because i do have the dream chaser that i just finished building which you saw at the beginning of this episode you know let's play with that for a little while yet uh so what i got instead was experimental aerodynamics for the Mark III space shuttle parts. So uh, I think I'm overdue for a better, bigger space shuttle. So uh, that is the one I went with. 
And uh, then we'll hop out here to um, one of my interplanetary relays. This is out in Keo stationary orbit. Uh, the reason I'm out here is for a really cheap contract that I picked up to point a dish antenna to uh, one of the inner planets. So here we are, I'm pointing this at Moho. Boom, there we go. Actually, I might as well keep it pointed at Moho because I do have, you might have caught a glimpse of it in the alarm clock menu uh, that uh, I do have a probe that is closing in on Moho as we speak. That's coming up in a near to come episode as well. But I think we do have one more launch to do, so why don't we take advantage of our location right now and take in the view as we time warp to the completion of MapSat 6. This, well, like all mapping satellites, it's on its way to into a polar orbit, and this is just going to be around Kerbin. So I thought I'd use the opportunity to, once again, admire Scatter and Real Plume and uh, the Eve Mod and all the rest, but also talk about the Delta V requirements to go into orbits of different inclinations. I've done that a lot in this series, but I don't think I've ever talked about how to calculate that Delta V. Now, I do have two contracts associated with this. One is to do a biome scan of Kerbin. This contract actually predates the contract configurator update and all those contracts you saw me scooping up earlier. It's the whole reason I built this thing in the first place. And the second contract, what actually sounds like pretty much the same contract, is to do a multi-spectral scan of Kerbin. So, uh, Whatever, I'm going to cake it, it's fine. So uh, why don't we talk about uh, calculating delta V? So we know that to get into low orbit about Kerbin takes about a velocity of about 2,250 meters per second to maintain that orbit. And that's the velocity is the same regardless of the inclination of the orbit. That's just a function of its altitude, really, of its semi-major axis. So getting into a polar orbit, you're still going to need that same velocity. Now the advantage when you go into a prograde orbit is that you're going to take advantage of Kerbin's already rotation. And at the equator, Kerbin is rotating at 175 meters per second. So in fact, you only need to add on, if you subtract those two numbers, 2,075 meters per second of velocity to your vessel to get into orbit. Well, of course, the delta V requirements are quite a bit more than that. I usually budget about 3,550 meters per second of vacuum delta V in order to get into orbit. And that's because you've got to get up to altitude, and you also have to push the atmosphere out of your way, and that's going to cost you. So let's divide those two numbers. The extra velocity I need, the 2,075, and divide that into the 3,550, which is my delta V budget for getting into a low equity orbit and I get 1.71 I consider this sort of a, uh, a multiplier for the fact that you need to increase your altitude and go through the atmosphere okay now let's consider a retrograde orbit here we're going a polar orbit I know but let's consider a retrograde orbit in a retrograde orbit you got to work against the 175 meters per second uh, that Kerbin is rotating to the east, because when you go retrograde, you're going to launch to the west. So you need that 2,250 meters per second plus. You need to negate that 175 meters per second that you're already moving in an eastward direction, giving you a total required velocity change of 2,425 meters per second. Multiplying by a correction factor of 1.71 gives us to get to a retrograde orbit should require about 4,147, I'd probably make that 4,150 meters per second in order to insert yourself into a retrograde low orbit about Kerbin. Okay, now, polar orbit time. In a polar orbit, you're moving perpendicularly to um, the velocity that Kerbin is rotating, that 175 meters per second. And to combine vectors that are perpendicular to each other, you need to use the Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to take the two velocities, we're going to square them, add them together, and take the square root. And if we do that, we get 2,257 meters per second of additional velocity I need to give to my vessel. Multiplying by the 1.71 correction factor for moving through the atmosphere and getting to altitude requires a total delta V of 3,859 or 3,860 
meters per second. So that's what I budget in a mission like this one in order to get myself into a polar orbit. And in fact, if you know a little bit about vectors and know a little bit about trigonometry, you can actually calculate yourself a little equation that will calculate the delta V for getting into a low orbit about Kerbin regardless for any inclination and here's the formula right here. I'm sorry if it looks a little bit complicated but it's not too bad and the I in the formula is the inclination that you want. Now like I said earlier in the episode uh, this is just my own way of doing it. It seems to work. I've launched many things into very different inclinations including retrograde orbits and it does seem to uh, to work just fine though I'm sure there's a more technical more precise way to do it but and if one of you has that more precise way I'd love to hear it but uh, you know I'm gonna stick with what I got it's nice and simple and it seems to work anyway let's bring this mission home the mission itself is actually pretty mundane we're gonna put this into an orbit uh, I'm gonna go for a 250 kilometer roughly circular polar orbit here we are coming over the North Pole, admiring the shimmering auroras. Well, I am a little bit curious why you can see them on the day side, but you can't see them on the night side, but uh, we'll let that go. So many beautiful things, I can't get too nitpicky. And then over here, we'll, after we've circularized, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at the new toys on this thing. I do have a multi-spectral analyzer for the contracts. That's a, that's a scanner you've seen before. I've had that unlocked for some time, but I do have a new toy. This is a high gain altimetry scanner. Um, we had a low gain altimetry scanner unlocked for quite some time, but this should give us a higher resolution map of Kerbin. I'll make sure I put some over the moon and around Minmus too. Now I can see that the biome scanner contract has already started. What about the uh, multi-spectral scanner here? Let's scroll, I'll open this up a bit and uh, oh dear. I gotta get an altitude of about 492 kilometers and I'm at about 250 kilometers. And I didn't budget for this. Again, this is a, one of the contracts I just picked up in this video. I didn't design this vehicle for this contract. I thought I might be able to scoop it up for free. Okay, well, it turned out that I didn't, I tried, but I didn't have the fuel to get it to its required altitude. Yeah, me and my stingy budgets just bit me in the behind yeah my apoapsis is at 493 kilometers but my periapsis is only around 283 kilometers and they both need to be up at about this altitude oh well so what we'll have to do in some future mission is we'll have to send some kerbals up here add a little bit of monoprop to this thing so it can get into its proper orbit that's obviously going to have to be for a future episode. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.